This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Twilight of the Idols, or How to Philosophize with the Hammer, by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Anthony M. Ludovici. Translator's Preface The Twilight of the Idols was written towards the end of the summer of 1888. Its composition seems to have occupied only a few days, so few indeed that, in Ecce Homo, page 118, Nietzsche says he hesitates to give their number, but in any case we know it was completed on the 3rd of September in Sils Maria. The manuscript which was dispatched to the printers on the 7th of September bore the title, Idle Hours of a Psychologist. This, however, was abandoned in favor of the present title, while the work was going through the press. During September and the early part of October 1888, Nietzsche added to the original contents of the book by inserting the whole section entitled, Things the Germans Lack, and aphorisms, 32-43, through 43, of skirmishes in a war with the age. And the book, as it now stands, represents exactly the form in which Nietzsche intended to publish it in the course of the year. 1889. Unfortunately, its author was already stricken down with illness when the work first appeared at the end of January 1889, and he was denied the joy of seeing it run into nine editions, of one thousand each, before his death in 1900. Of the Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche says in Ecce Homo, page 118, quote, If anyone should desire to obtain a rapid sketch of how everything before my time was standing on its head, he should begin reading me in this book. That which is called Idols on the title page is simply the old truth that has been believed in hitherto. In plain English, the twilight of the idols means that the old truth is on its last legs. Unquote. Certain it is that, for a rapid survey of the whole of Nietzsche's doctrine, no book, save perhaps the section entitled Of Old and New Tables in Thus Spake Zarathustra, could be of more real value than the Twilight of the Idols. Here Nietzsche is quite at his best. He is ripe for the marvelous feat of the transvaluation of all values. Nowhere is his language, that marvelous weapon, which in his hand became at once so supple and so murderous, more forceful and more condensed. Nowhere are his thoughts more profound. But all this does not by any means imply that this book is the easiest of Nietzsche's works. On the contrary, I very much fear that, unless the reader is well prepared, not only in Nietzscheism, but also in the habit of grappling with uncommon and elusive problems, a good deal of the contents of this work will tend rather to confuse than to enlighten him in regard to what Nietzsche actually wishes to make clear in these pages. How much prejudice, for instance, how many traditional and deep-seated opinions must be uprooted, if we are to see even so much as an important note of interrogation in the section entitled The Problem of Socrates, not to speak of such sections as morality as the enemy of nature, the four great errors, etc. The errors exposed in these sections have a tradition of two thousand years behind them, and only a fantastic dreamer could expect them to be eradicated by a mere casual study of these pages. Indeed, Nietzsche himself looked forward only to a gradual change in the general view of the questions he discussed. He knew only too well what the conversion of light heads was worth, and what kind of man would probably be the first to rush into his arms, and, grand psychologist that he was, he guarded himself beforehand against bad company by means of his famous warning, quote, The first adherents of a creed do not prove anything against it, unquote. To the aspiring student of Nietzsche, however, it ought not to be necessary to become an immediate convert in order to be interested in the treasure of thought which Nietzsche here lavishes upon us. For such a man, it will be quite difficult enough to regard the questions raised in this work as actual problems. Once, however, he has succeeded in doing this, and has given his imagination time to play round these questions as problems, 
the particular turn or twist that Nietzsche gives to their elucidation may then perhaps strike him not only as valuable, but as absolutely necessary. With regard to the substance of the Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche says in Ecce Homo, page 119, quote, There is the waste of an all-too-rich autumn in this book. You trip over truths. You even crush some to death. There are too many of them. Unquote. And what are these truths? They are things that are not yet held to be true. They are the utterances of a man who, as a single exception, escaped for a while the general insanity of Europe, with its blind idealism in the midst of squalor, with its unscrupulous praise of so-called progress, while it stood knee-deep in the belittlement of man, and with its vulgar levity in the face of effeminacy and decay. They are the utterances of one who voiced the hopes, the aims, and the realities of another world. Not of an ideal world, not of a world beyond, but of a real world, of this world regenerated and reorganized upon a sounder, a more virile, and a more orderly basis. In fact, of a perfectly possible world, one that has already existed in the past and could exist again, if only the stupendous revolution of a transvaluation of all values were made possible. This, then, is the nature of the truths uttered by this one sane man in the whole of Europe at the end of last century, and when, owing to his unequal struggle against the overwhelming hostile forces of his time, his highly sensitive personality was at last forced to surrender itself to the enemy and become one with them, that is to say, insane. At least the record of his sanity had been safely stored away, beyond the reach of time and change, in the volumes which constitute his life work. Anthony M. Ludovici Narrator's Note The translator's preface is cut short here, since in the volume as published, the note also addressed the other works by Nietzsche also included within this same volume, within Nietzsche's collected works. I have omitted the translator's prefacatory remarks with regard to the other works included within the printed volume, but not within this recording. End narrator's note. End translator's preface. Preface to maintain a cheerful attitude of mind in the midst of a gloomy and exceedingly responsible task is no slight artistic feat. And yet, what could be more necessary than cheerfulness? Nothing ever succeeds which exuberant spirits have not helped to produce. Surplus power alone is the proof of power, a transvaluation of all values, this note of interrogation which is so black, so huge, that it casts a shadow even upon him who affixes it is a task of such fatal import that he who undertakes it is compelled every now and then to rush out into the sunlight in order to shake himself free from an earnestness that becomes crushing, far too crushing. This end justifies every means, every event on the road to it is a windfall. Above all, war. War has always been the great policy of all spirits who have penetrated too far into themselves, or who have grown too deep. A wound stimulates the recuperative powers. For many years a maxim, the origin of which I withhold from learned curiosity, has been my motto. In crescunt animi, viracit volnere virtus. At other times... Another means of recovery which is even more to my taste is to cross-examine idols. There are more idols than realities in the world. This constitutes my evil eye for this world. It is also my evil ear. To put questions in this quarter with a hammer, and to hear, perchance, that well-known hollow sound which tells of blown-out frogs. What a joy this is! For one who has ears even behind his ears, for an old psychologist and pied piper like myself, in whose presence precisely that 
which would fain be silent, must betray itself. Even this treatise, as its title shows, is above all a recreation, a ray of sunshine, a leap sideways of a psychologist in his leisure moments. Maybe, too, a new war. And are we again cross-examining new idols? This little work is a great declaration of war, and with regard to the cross-examining of idols, this time it is not the idols of the age, but eternal idols, which are here struck with a hammer as with a tuning fork. There are certainly no idols which are older, more convinced, and more inflated. Neither are there any more hollow. This does not alter the fact that they are believed in more than any others. Besides, they are never called idols, at least not the most exalted among their number. Friedrich Nietzsche, Turin, the 30th of September, 1888, on the day when the first book of the Transvaluation of All Values was finished. End Preface This recording is in the public domain.